Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. This is a treat and an honor for me to be able to interview the American Treasury Secretary, uh, Jack Lew. Jack, thank you very much for coming. And Always for, good to uh, be with you. For being here. Um, anything going on in the world these days? <laughs> um, uh, give us your sense of why we're seeing um, this roiling of global markets right now. What do you think is behind it? Let me start with the United States. Um, I think the United States um, continues to grow, and uh, it's still a, a source of confidence in the world. You look at the statistics in the United States over the last several months, we've seen record auto sales, we've seen the housing market doing better. Uh, notwithstanding pretty substantial international headwinds, we've seen uh, continued growth. Now, there are a lot of headwinds, and there are factors out there in the world uh, to be focusing on. But I think it's important to start with where are we? Because mm -hmm. yeah. it's important to us in the United States, right. but it's important to the global economy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I look around the world, and uh, there are a lot of, of headwinds. We've seen for several years now very sluggish growth in demand. Um, that's led to a, 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 a not strong enough global economy. And now that things are developing in parts of the global economy that, um, that, that are disruptive, um, people are reacting um, uh, to it. Uh, I think it's important to look at some of these things and realize that with each downside, there's sometimes an upside. So take lower oil prices. Yeah. We've seen a lot of focus in the last couple of weeks on the disruption that lower oil prices are causing in some of the producing economies, in parts of the United States yeah. where there's production. Most of the world consumes oil, and for anyone consuming oil, lower oil prices are a tax cut. It puts more money in people's pockets. It actually has a positive effect. That doesn't mean the disruptions aren't real. It doesn't mean you don't have pockets that could be problematic. It doesn't mean you won't have some firms that have really bad times or even go bankrupt. But it doesn't mean that it has to be bad overall for the global economy. There's been a lot of attention on China, um, and um, you know, I have to tell you, have following China very closely as I do, um, I don't see the situation today as being so dramatically different from what we were seeing at the end of last year. Uh, China is in the midst of a long and difficult transition. Their economy has historically been a, an industrial economy that focuses on export, and they're in a transition to a more consumer-driven economy. That's a tough and disruptive process. I think that it shouldn't be a surprise that China's growth rate is slowing down. That's been something that's been underway. And, and the question really is, can they reach a sustainable, healthy, stable growth rate with a mix of consumer and industrial um, activities that is sustainable? That will depend on the policies they pursue. I think the question that should be asked right now is, will China stick to the reform policies that open up its markets, that will let some of the state-owned enterprises that are producing goods that have no market either reduce in size or, in some cases, close down? And that's bumpy. That's hard. The real question is, are they prepared to follow through on an agenda that they've charted out and they've said is in their own best interest? Um, and that's, uh, the, the, I think, a very important question. That will have a lot to do with whether, in the long term, China has the kind of sustainable growth rate that's important for China and the global economy. So I, I know it's been bumpy days in the markets. I try to look beyond the hour-to-hour, day-to-day at what the big trends are. Obviously, markets are, are significant, and I'm not minimizing that it's been very choppy in, in the markets. But uh, yeah, I think you do have to look at some of these underlying things uh, in a longer term way. You know, Mr. Secretary, your, your point about China reminds me, every time I'm in India, people ask me about China. And every time I'm in China, people ask me about India. And I finally developed a, an answer for both of them. So to me, uh, China and India are like two superhighways. Uh, Chinese superhighway, six lanes, perfectly paved, all the stripes, you know, right down the middle, street lamps, sidewalks, and uh, everyone's going 80 miles an hour. There's just one problem. Off in the distance, there's a speed bump called political reform. 
<laughs> and the big question for me about China is what happens when 1.3 billion people going 80 miles an hour hit a speed bump? Yeah. The car jumps up, slams down, and one of two things happen. One, they say, you okay? You okay? I'm okay. They drive on. <laughs> uh, and the other is all the wheels fall off. Right. And um, right. uh, in India, now, um, uh, a superhighway, uh, none of the lanes are defined, um, half the sidewalks aren't finished, and half the streetlights are out. But off in the distance, it looks like it smooths out into a perfect six-lane <laughs> superhighway. Um, and I asked myself, is that the Mirage or is that the Oasis? Okay. So they each have a huge question right. mark. But the common denominator, and this is really implied by your answer, uh, is that it's really about politics. That ultimately, yeah. whether China can make this difficult transition and India really is going to be about politics. Well, I would say it's about policy, but po policy yeah. doesn't get executed um, without politics. Yes, yeah. um, it's a, uh, India has a much more robust rate of growth than yeah. it had in the past. Yes. It is one of the bright spots right now in terms of growth. Uh, but they need to stick to their reform agenda to be where they need to be next yeah. year and the year after. And, uh, and look, it's hard in any of our countries to stick to tough reforms. Anything that's disruptive is hard. Yeah. But the price of not doing those things um, is very significant. Um, you know, it, 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 it will be very telling if, if uh, a year from now China has stuck to its reform agenda, if it's managed to, 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 to its, 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 its exchange rate in a way that the world understands and that's not seen as, uh, as something that's trying to gain unfair advantage, right. but to manage to have an orderly transition uh, to a more market-determined uh, exchange rate. It, whether they look at their industrial capacity and allow it to right-size by letting market forces, uh, not top-down decisions, uh, work. These, these are big ifs, and I, th I think the, the, in any of our uh, uh, political systems, the, uh, the, the ifs depend on policymakers making the right decisions. But I think it's important at a moment of unease um, to remember that we have a lot of control, each of us in our own systems, and we should just throw up our hands and, and say th there's bad things happening. Uh, and and uh, that's why I focus on what can we as policymakers do and what can our political systems do. I want to go back to your oil point because I am baffled by that. Uh, every morning here I fire up my iPhone and I go to you know, CNBC.com and I see uh, all red numbers and at the top it says it's because oil went down another dollar today. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. This is the world has gotten a, a huge tax cut. Yeah. I mean, when you think of going from $4 a gallon, basically, to something close now to a dollar, um, and yet the multiplier doesn't seem to be working in that direction. All the multiplier seems to be working in the direction of, oh my god, this means uh, drillers in North Dakota may go bankrupt and pull down the North Dakota National Bank of Fargo or whatever is out to go. Right. Um, what, what, I don't, what's going on there? Well, uh, first, I, I don't think it's, it's true that it's not working. Look, look at Europe. Europe mm -hmm. is doing better this year than they did last year, and part of the reason is Here's lower energy. oil prices. Mm -hmm. Um, the U.S. has continued to do well in the face of international headwinds, yeah. in part because consumers have more money in their pocket. Um, you know, in the United States, one of the things that um, we're, we, uh, we're still trying to understand, the data comes in a little late, so you don't get a crystal clear picture in real time. But uh, are consumers spending what they are saving uh, at the pump? And it certainly seems that they're doing two things. They are consuming maybe a different mix of goods than th they used to consume, but that is just a change of preference. But they're also improving their household balance sheets. Now, we don't think it's a bad thing if uh, a household is Saves a less bit. indebted, more savings, and can weather a bump in the road or have a, a, a larger amount of money to spend on a capital uh, item. And there is some evidence that that's what people are doing. I don't, th I don't think we know with, uh, with absolute um, you know, firmness what consumers are doing until all the data uh, is in and we can look in the rear view mirror. Um, but I don't think uh, it, it, we should assume that that money is just evaporating. It, it can only go of one of two places. Yeah. It either is spent or it's saved. Interesting. Yeah. So here's a question. I'm working on a new book right now. And um, it's been interesting. You know, with my first book, which I wrote in 1988, I actually had uh, I hired an assistant. He was a young man. Uh, he was a physical person, a living and breathing. He, he sat in the desk next to me, and I would ask him questions. And he would go over. I was at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., and he would go over to the library. And, 
Um, now I have this amazing assistant. Um, she answers every question. Um, uh, I don't pay her anything. Um, and uh, she's called Google. And, um, uh, and what's really amazing is um, before I came here, you know, I could put in um, you know, Jack Lou on oil prices. And she would just tell me everything you said on oil prices. That is so productive for me. I don't know how much time I saved. Yeah. That took me uh, less than a minute. Right. Um, but I'm being told now by certain experts that um, none, of, none of this compares to a flush toilet um, and, uh, or, or electrification. Um, are we measuring productivity properly? A lot of people are asking that question. Productivity is very hard to measure. And um, it's always going to be imprecise. And at moments of change, uh, it has to catch up. Uh, and I think we're at a moment of profound change. Um, you know, two years ago, I remember being here and talking about the pay rate of change in technology being faster than any change that had ever been experienced. Um, and that we were just at the tip of uh, seeing what that benefit would be. Um, you know, I think there's probably a truth between um, uh, you know, the theory that, uh, that it doesn't amount to much and it's the most important change ever. But you know, I, I, I find it, uh, you know, the experience you described, uh, we all have. I mean, we're, there's not a one of us who, when we're on the telephone with somebody and they mention something that we weren't expecting, can't, while we're talking on the phone, get briefed up and have the first conversation be the last conversation. And you don't have to then do it two or three times. Um, that happens in every aspect uh, of life. I don't know that that's measured perfectly. Um, I think we also have a, a challenge that the structure of the economy is changing as we have um, technology uh, doing more of the work and it, it, the, the, the amount of labor it takes uh, to do the same thing. You don't have that assistant anymore. Um, now, what does that mean as it flows through? Are there enough jobs for software designers uh, to make up for all of those other jobs that are, are lost? I visit factories pretty regularly, um, and you see different people in factories than you did uh, hmm. 10 years ago. In what way? You, you, you see people with a, a higher set of skills, technical skills, um, doing more things with the support of technology. Hmm. Um, and one has to believe that that will show up in productivity at some point if it's not already. Um, but you also have to ask, how are we making sure we have enough people with those skills in the future? And that comes back to what do we do as uh, political and, and, and policy makers? Um, do we bring the next generation out of high school and college with the skills to take the next turn? And to harness technology as opposed to feel like they're victims of technology? And you know, this is something we feel very strongly about. We need to do better in the United States because you end up with a very unfair distribution of opportunity if some people have the skills you need to succeed and others don't. But economists tell us there's no skills gap. If there were, wages would be going up for those skills that are uh, not in sufficient supply. But economists also tell us that we have millions of unfilled jobs in the United States and millions of people looking for work and they don't quite match up mm -hmm. because they don't have the right skills. I guess there's only efficient markets, um, uh, you know, when um, uh, you're talking about Alan Greenspan and, and, and that, but there's not a fit. But, uh, I look at the jobs numbers, e each of the different aspects of them on a very regular yeah. basis. Um, you know, I, I, look, I think the, yesterday the president was in Detroit mm -hmm. and he, um, he you know, observed that since the, the Great Recession, when we thought we were going to lose all of our auto companies, we've added 600,000 jobs in auto manufacturing. So clearly, there are manufacturing jobs of the future. The question is, are we bringing the next generation up with the skills to make sure there always are more manufacturing yes. jobs in the future? Can we harness technology? I think the United States has great advantages with technology because we have the most stable system and, and, and the best human and physical resources uh, that you could ask for. If that's the challenge, how do you look at um, a country like a Russia today or a Venezuela or the Arab oil producing countries? Um, they're going to go from $100 a barrel plus to, you know, something in the low 30s uh, or, or high 20s now. Um, what are those countries going to do at a time when manufacturing at scale, in terms of employment at scale, may not be available for emerging markets in the fourth industrial revolution? Look, I think that if you look at a, a, an oil producer where oil has been the lion's share of the economy, um, uh, they are, I think, 
correctly looking at how can they diversify their economy and have more things that they do than just uh, producing oil. Um, I think there are opportunities for emerging economies. There's a lot of parts of the world that don't have the kind of uh, technology hubs and uh, financial hubs that they need to make the, 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 the step forward that they need. You look at the annual report on the, the doing business report, mm -hmm. there's a lot of countries and regions of the world where uh, there's a lot of services that don't exist, that should exist. Those are opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, now you need to have uh, a, a, an honest, transparent system of government, yes. and, and your financial system has to be so. Yeah. You have to be open to technology uh, and, and not close to it and fearful of it. You have to protect property rights. Um, so all of the things that it takes to develop those kinds of economic uh, engines are hard. But there are also opportunities. It's not uh, that they have to go back and be 19th century uh, uh, manufacturing economies to have more diversified economies. Is it easier to be the American Treasury Secretary here after we've uh, you, you persuaded Congress to pay our IMF dues? It's, it's easier to be anywhere. <laughs> like I think the, the Congress's ratification of the IMF quota reforms was enormously important. Um, you know, the United States have been a leader, the leader, in the post-World War II international financial uh, system. Uh, for five years, uh, the world was waiting for the United States to approve reforms of the IMF that were profoundly in the U.S.'s interest, but our political process couldn't quite do it. We managed to get that done, and just this week we're finalizing at the IMF the details, both in terms of policy changes at the IMF and the transactions of money. Now, I think if you look at the series of things we've done this year, it really makes a clear statement that the U.S. is committed to maintaining the economic leadership role in the next decades ahead. We have passed Trade Promotion Authority, which opens a door to, for trade for TPP, to the Pacific Agreement, to be approved. We've reauthorized the Export-Import Bank that was sitting there on the fence, would it or wouldn't it be uh, extended? And now we've done IMF quota reform. I think that's a profound statement that the U.S. is committed to playing an international leadership role in a changing world. And what IMF quota reform does that's so important is it says that for us to continue to play a leadership role, it doesn't mean we have to tell economies that have grown tremendously in the last 70 years that they don't get to step up and play a significant role as well. I think quota reform was more than about money. It was about a seat at the table. It was about having the, 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 the conversation about international financial policy be a more inclusive one. And if you want to hold all the leading countries of the world to those standards, they have to be, have ownership of those decisions. And I think the U.S. has to remain a leader. So I am of quota reform, I think, is, a, is, is something that is profoundly important. You know, in your previous job, as Secretary, you were the chief of staff of the White House. You had to deal with politics. And we're, we're at this really um, somewhat amazing political moment. Um, we have a, a Marxist, basically, at the head of the British Labor Party. Um, we have a, a socialist, um, a self declared uh, socialist, um, uh, competing head to head now with Hillary Clinton for the Democratic nomination. Um, uh, and we have, in my words, not yours, a borderline fascist um, running for the head of the opposition party. Um, uh, uh, or let's say a, very, a deeply conservative man, um, uh, two of them actually. One is a bigger knucklehead than the other. Um, and, uh, but what do you think is going on? We're, we're seeing strange stuff that we have not seen in our lifetime emerging on the political landscape. To what extent do you think this is being driven by economics, by the roiling of the economy? So Tom, unlike uh, my past position, uh, the position I have now is thankfully one where uh, I don't do politics yeah. and uh, I, I don't comment on politics. Um, I do think that there are things in our economy that are leaving people uneasy. Um, the, the, the fact that it, it does not necessarily appear to everyone that it's an economy that they can get ahead in, even if they do the right thing, even if they play by the rules and work hard. Um, I think we as policymakers, not just as politicians, have to be concerned that there's a sense and a reality that there's shared opportunity. That doesn't mean equal outcomes, mm -hmm. but it, the door has to be open to everyone. And um, you know, I, I think the, 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 the way we conduct public debate has to be one that um, our publics look at and feel better about. 
feel that it's got a pathway yeah. to, um, to producing that, that equal opportunity. What are the causes of that unequal opportunity? What, what do you think's been happening in, in the economy that has made it, so many few people feel that it's less inclusive, that maybe even if I do all the right things, as, as you said, I'm, I'm actually not gonna be able to pay the bills. So let, let me give you an example in the world that I'm in now, uh, financial inclusion. Um, you know, we have 30 million Americans working who are not saving for retirement. Um, most people who are saving aren't saving enough. You have uh, an, an inordinate number of millions of people who can't get basic banking services. Now, why does this matter? If you don't have banking services- In America. Services, in America, billions of people around mm, the world. Yeah. And it's a global as well as a US problem, and we're focusing on it both globally and domestically. If you don't have a credit history, if you don't have a bank account, if you don't exist as far as the financial system is concerned, you can't get a mortgage and so you can't buy a house. Mm. You can't get a small business loan, so you can't become a small and medium-sized enterprise. Um, the door to opportunity just doesn't open for you. Mm. It's one of the reasons we're focusing so much at the Treasury Department on financial education, on helping to get people into the habit of saving by creating something called MyRA, where you just go to myra.gov and open an account, and you can put that $5 a, a pay period away, no minimum, no charges, a safe investment. We know that people are worried about losing their principal. This is a way you don't have to put your principal at risk. You don't have to have an employer who offers you the opportunity. Um, I don't think there's any one easy solution. Uh, and I don't want to suggest that financial inclusion alone is the answer, but it's a part of it. It's a big part of it. Because if you don't get people into our financial system, um, they become part of that economy that we have trouble measuring and seeing. And it's also a part of the economy around the world that breeds dangerous activities. The, the, the informal economy is, a, is, is another name for off the books. And that's where money can go into the wrong hands all too easily. So if you accomplish financial inclusion, you're also making both our country and the global, mm. wor yeah, the, the financial system right. and the world safer. So I, I think that, that, that this is something, you know, you, you can, I could have given you other examples. That's mm. one that I think is very tangible. We're both baby boomers um, and our uh, contemporaries and we will soon be retiring. Um, and I've seen really scary numbers in terms of uh, how much savings people have as compared to how much they will need, particularly in a zero uh, interest rate environment or, or very low interest rate environment. How do you think about, this would be our last question, how do you feel about that challenge? How, how, how it's gonna be for you and your successors obviously to manage, but that feels like a really big train coming down the tracks. Look, I, th I think that it's a, it is a huge challenge. Um, uh, we can't just look at our generation, we have to look at kids who are in high school now yeah. and make sure that they start saving earlier. Uh, we have to make it easy for people in the middle of their careers uh, to save more. Part of that is by having employers uh, make it easier for people to save. If we had just a simple change that you opt in instead of opt out mm. of saving for retirement, we know from behavioral economics that most people don't opt out. Mm. So our system yeah. d could improve. That, that requires you know, some change of law. Mm. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, as pessimistic uh, uh, about um, the, 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 the overall picture facing uh, retirees. Um, uh, I think Social Security is going to be there for people. Um, I think people can save more. But I think that for those who haven't saved more, it's, it's going to manifest itself as being tough choices. Do you retire later in order to take your savings and spread it over fewer years? Um, do you uh, change your standard of living? And those are tough choices. So I think a lot of people will be working longer. Um, the, 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 it, it can't be something we just ask, what do we do for people who are 60 years old right. today? Uh, we have to ask, what do we do to build a system that works for people who are 20 and 30 and 40, and also for people who are 60? Well, you know, I have to say, Mr. Secretary, I came in here feeling sort of dark and gloomy and worried, and, um, uh, and I, I greatly appreciate your equanimity and um, your, your, uh, your, your, your slight optimism. Uh, cautious, cautious optimism. Cautious optimism. <laughs> and uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna run out and buy some stocks. So thank you very <laughs> I, much. I don't give <laughs> any stock advice. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much.